Hello folks and thank you for joining me again for another spooky story. I know I haven't uploaded in a while for the handful of people that do actually uh, watch these videos. I apologize. My work schedule got kind of weird. I was going to be full time for the summer but then they changed it and now I'm not and they just can't seem to really decide uh, what they want to do because even, even now my hours are actually not set in stone for the future, but it did mean that, unfortunately, recording stories and things had to take a little bit of a back burner, so um, I'm going to try and upload as much as I can over the course of the summer, but um, again, work schedule just kind of weird at the moment, so it'll be fit in sort of uh, wherever and however I can. Another announcement, uh, I know I have spoken a bit before, about, um, <clears throat> pardon me, just gonna play with something on the microphone here, just bear with me. So I have spoken before about a special project. Um, the special project is going to be me writing a version of a famous piece, well, a, fa a famous, yeah, semi-famous, I guess it's pretty well known, a famous piece of local folklore. So obviously I didn't come up with the folklore, but it would be me writing an original thing and telling you the story. And I, again, I've been trying to bloody cat hair. I've been trying to uh, get that off the ground. It's just, again, work got kind of crazy and really stressful. So I've decided that um, I'm going to be aiming for that, um, to have that out in time for Halloween, and that will hopefully be this year's Halloween special. So hopefully that will be um, an original, semi-original uh, piece that I have written myself, instead of sort of standing on the shoulders of all these um, admittedly probably much uh, better written uh, stories from the past. So pardon me for just a moment here. It's not wine, it's just water and um, I call it squirt flavor, but you know like the little um, drop Mio things you can put in water. So who's excited to uh, finally be moving out of a lockdown situation? We can actually go out and do things again. I certainly am. Uh, I went to the gym this morning for the first time in ages and it felt great. I feel really good and in kind of top condition to uh, read this episode's story for you. And again, same disclaimer that I always give at the start of these videos. These are Victorian ghost stories or Edwardian. Today's, I believe, is Victorian. I believe it's 1880s. And as such, these stories will often contain unpleasant things about race, gender, religion, orientation, anything you can think of, but um, I don't really believe in censoring that for you or pretending that it doesn't exist, so I do leave those things in. And if that doesn't sound quite like your cup of tea, feel free to pass me over and find some other YouTube video that is more to your taste. And of course, the other warning is that um, the things that give rise to ghost stories are usually unpleasant, murders, suicides, macabre happenings. And again, I know that's not for everybody, so if that also does not seem quite like your cup of tea, feel free to, uh, to pass me right by and um, and find another video more to your liking. With all of that out of the way, today I will be reading for you a short story called The Cold Hand. And this one has a bit of a twist ending that I'll, um, for a couple reasons that I will get into at the end of the video. And the story uh, will make a little more sense once I tell you, I think, the name of the, um, the book or the anthology that it is actually taken from, but it's called The Cold Hand, and it's by an American illustrator. So uh, he was primarily an illustrator. He did a lot of work for the big names of the time, um, Charles Dickens, Nathaniel Hawthorne, although like he's obviously older than Victorian, Washington Irving, Longfellow. I'm just, I just have his wiki page open beside me here, and it's kind of impressive. Uh, his name, and it's a good name, 
Felix Octavius Carr Darley. What a name. Um, he's, uh, it's abbreviated here to FOC Darley. So I might call him FOC throughout the video. I might just call him Darley. Um, he's actually got a pretty good 19th century mustache if you uh, decide to have a closer look at him. Uh, he did do some work with Edgar Allan Poe as well, although I don't know that it was ever actually published, but they, they were, uh, he was contracted to do some illustrations for Poe at, uh, at one point, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, primarily an illustrator and not an author, but this story was pretty cool, so I um, really wanted to share it with you. And just keep glancing at my face in the little video window here. This is not the makeup look I was going for when I started uh, earlier today, but it is the one I ended up with, and I didn't care enough to take it all off and try again, so here we are, looking vaguely, I don't know, like I should be performing in cabaret, perhaps? I don't know, I don't know if I can kick that high. It's probably not a good career move for me. So, uh, Please uh, get yourself something nice and cold to drink. It's definitely warming up here. Settle on down into your favorite spot and let's get into The Cold Hand by F.O.C. Darley. An eminent American artist relates the following story of a terrible adventure which befell him during his residence in Europe. I was traveling from Paris to Brussels. Pardon me. I was traveling from Paris to Brussels in the diligence. I don't know if that's being used in a way, well, it's obviously being used in a way I'm not familiar with, but should I be saying that Frenchly? I don't know. Either way, I wish I could be. I wish that was my life, just traveling in Europe like they used to do when you were young or an artist and doing your grand tour. That'd be kind of cool. On my arrival one, one evening, at a little village near Dieppe, I forgot the name of it, I found the village inn so crowded that the landlord could not even give me a bed upon which I might sleep in the house. He undertook, however, to receive my luggage and give me a lodging in the neighborhood, and with this arrangement, I was obligated, obliged rather, to be satisfied. I mean, he is kind of like doing you a favor there. I don't know that you need to make that you could sound a little more grateful, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> they could have just turned you away. After having partaken of a comfortable supper, I was waited upon by a servant with a lantern who was to conduct me to the house where I was destined by my evil stars to pass the night. Again, I don't know if I would say that's like they're helping you out. Like, I don't know. That's... To borrow a modern phrase, first world problem, right there. It was a lone house of two stories and quite small, situated on a wide heath, some half a mile distant from the inn. That's not that far, shut up. There were but three rooms on a floor, and on knocking at the door, I was admitted by a melancholy-looking young woman, whose dress and appearance bespoke poverty, although she was neat and tidy. Yeah, because... Poor people are always scruffy and gross looking. That's not at all a stupid and hurtful stereotype. Oh, the morality of how we perceive poor people. I'm kind of hoping this guy gets haunted really bad. Maybe it's just those, those opening sentences, but like, I'm already thinking he's kind of a dick. On being conducted into the apartment which served as a kitchen, I found no one there. It appeared that the house was inhabited only by this young woman. That's brave of her. Seeing in my countenance a look of wonder and inquiry, she merely remarked that she was often in the habit of receiving lodgers from the inn when it was full, and that she would endeavor to afford me a comfortable room for the night. So... That's, again, a lone woman living by herself in the... Actually, the story is older than what I thought. It's 1840s, I think. Uh, just taking in lodgers when the inn is full. That's, uh, that's pretty brave of her. That, see, that's the true horror of the Victorian era right there. Misogyny. 
among other things. And I just say that because, as I like, I know I'm rambling a bit here, but like, that's brave of her, considering, I don't know, considering how little protection, legal and otherwise, there were for, there was for women in this time period, that's, that's brave of her. As it would have been ill-bred to ask any questions after this, doesn't stop you from making some unpleasant assumptions though, dude, does it? I sat looking at the fire for half an hour, speculating on the oddity of the thing. When the melancholy damsel went on with her sewing, which she had taken up as soon as I was seated. At last, being quite fatigued with my day's ride, I desired to be shown to my sleeping room. It was of very moderate dimensions and situated on the ground floor. In fact, it was but barely large enough to afford room for a single bed and a few inches of floor on one side of it where I might undress, and there was a window opening near the head of the bed. Sounds fine, like as long as it's clean. You're just sleeping there, bud. When my hostess had set down the candle, I locked the door, undressed myself, threw my clothes upon the bed, and was soon fast asleep. I suppose I might have slept two hours so that it was in the dead waste and middle of night. So, in the middle of the night, as the expression implied. I don't know why I felt the need to explain that one to you. That one's kind of obvious when I was suddenly awakened by a cold hand, as it might be the hand of a corpse, drawn deliberately over my face from the forehead to the chin, and so passing off a space downwards towards my feet. Horror struck, I started bolt upright and shouted in a tremulous but loud voice, Who's there? No answer. I stretched out my hands and felt all the three walls of the room near the head of the bed and found nothing but the said bare walls. I then got upon my knees on the bed and felt the walls all around the room as I could easily do by reason of its exceedingly limited dimensions. Again, dude, be a little more grateful to the people that are doing you a solid here. I then crept under the bed and fully satisfied myself that there was no living creature in the room but myself. You probably might, could you not have checked without crawling under the bed? I guess if the candle wasn't lit, it'd be kind of dark. Still, that's, that's a little weird. I've never felt compelled, no matter how creeped out I get at night, I've never felt compelled to like straight up just crawl under a strange bed. I think that's weird. It was mighty strange. Agreed. I could have sworn that I had felt that awful cold hand passing over my face. The thing was done so coolly and deliberately that there could be no mistake about it. Why did I not grasp the hand? I don't know, because it was like gross and clammy and cold, and why would you? In fact, I was waked out of a profound, out of a profound sleep by its touch, and before I had time to seize it, it was gone. I stood wondering at the strange and incomprehensible nature of the thing for some minutes, and finally arrived at the at the reluctant admission that I must have been dreaming, that it was my imagination, that it was no hand at all, but the ghost of a hand. Foreshadowing. In a very confused and unsettled state of mind, I at length got into bed again, and still unrested from my fatigue, I speedily fell into a doze. Before I had completely lost my consciousness, however, I felt the same appalling sensation as before, that horrible corpse-like hand dragging itself like the body of a serpent over my face. Horror of horrors! I screamed out at the utmost pitch of my voice, Who's there? Who? What are you? Speak! Avant! Be gone! I sprang instantly out of bed and felt in the darkness all round the room again. There was no one to be found. There was nothing but empty space as before. I was, to use a homely phrase, completely dumbfounded. The former theory of dreams and imaginations would not hold good now. The thing was too real. It was a hand, and nothing but a hand. I could swear to it. It might be, and probably was, the hand of a dead man, but it had skin and bones and muscles and motion, and it had been sent, I thought, all the blood... Pardon me, and it had sent, I thought, all the blood in my body back to my heart as it passed over my face. 
It came and went this time more suddenly, so that I had not time to grasp at it, both of my hands being under the bedclothes. I mean, you could just have them, like, like ready to go, couldn't you? Like, if you're going to try and catch the ghost hands for reasons, like, be, like, have them in position, like, be ready to go. Now, I am an indifferent and well-informed person, something of a philosopher. Yeah, he sounds pretentious. I don't like this guy. And never had been a believer in ghosts or supernatural, supernatural appearance. Pardon me, I am speaking so poorly today, I do apologize. And had never been a believer in ghosts or supernatural ap appearances of any sort or kind. But this thing staggered me. I could not but think with Hamlet that there are many things which are not dreamt of in your philosophy. Where could the owner of the hand be? <laughs> it sounds so weird. Like a hand, the hand's just a stray dog that got away. Like, like thing from the Adams family. <laughs> he was not in the room. That was clear. There had not been time enough for him to escape from it, even if the door had not been locked, which it was very securely, as I had just proved. There was no fireplace, so he could not have crawled up the chimney. I mean, chimneys actually get really narrow really quickly. If you've ever, if you've ever looked up one, there's actually not a ton of space up there. There was no closet or hiding place of any kind. The thing was utterly inexplicable. I could make nothing of it, and in a desperate state of doubt and bewilderment, I once more betook myself to bed, and thought and thought about it till my brain ached again, but all to no purpose. Fatigue and drowsiness at length overcame me, and I slept till morning without further disturbance. It had been arranged that I should breakfast at the house where I slept. When I sat down, my melancholy hostess inquired how I had slept, hoped I had a comfortable night. On the contrary, replied I, the night was rather an uncomfortable one for me, such as I never desire to pass again. I then proceeded to narrate the whole affair as it had passed. She listened with fixed attention, only interrupting me with one or with uh, two or three questions. When I had concluded, she said, it must have been my poor drunken brother. I must tell you, sir, she continued, that I have an unfortunate brother of dissipated habits who lives with me here since the death of our parents. He often goes away and stays for weeks altogether without my hearing a word of his whereabouts. He probably came home in the middle of the night and not wishing to disturb me, went to the window of his bedroom, which you occupied last night, and thrust in his hand in order to ascertain whether any lodger was occupying his bed. He was probably too much intoxicated to take any notice of your exclamations, and having found his bed occupied, he has gone off and found lodging with someone of his acquaintance. Whether young hopeful came home... <clears throat> Pardon me. Whether young hopeful came home in the course of the day, I never learned, for in half an hour after this conversation, for in half an hour after this conversation, I was on my way to Brussels, perfectly satisfied with the melancholy young woman's solution of the dreadful mis mystery of the cold hand. It seems like there's a word missing there. Seems like it should be whether the young hopeful came home. No, it doesn't matter. I didn't write it. I probably don't have any business trying to correct this dude. So that is The Cold Hand by F.O.C. Darley. So I did tell you there was a bit of a twist in this one. Um, the twist, of course, if you haven't picked up on it, um, let me read you the full title of the book that this story appears in. It's called Ghost Stories, collected with a particular view to counteract the vulgar belief in ghosts and apparitions, with 10 engravings from desi designs of F.O.C. Darley. Darley's credited as writing this, um, or did he just do the illustrations? Pardon me. Oh, I 
check that. Huh. Well, everything I s am reading says he did write this particular story, at least, and do illustrations for the book. So I can't find anybody else credited as the author. So hopefully I was right when I told you um, he also wrote this. But the twist, of course, is that there is a perfect... See, I haven't done this in so long, my mouth just doesn't form coherent sentences anymore, that um, the twist is, of course, that there is no supernatural explanation. It's just some drunk asshole feeling up lodgers while he tries to figure out whether or not he can go home in the night or presumably sleep in a ditch somewhere. I just thought it was an interesting take. Um, if you are familiar with the Victorian era at all, you'll know that it's an age of contradictions. So you have things like the popularity of mediums and psychics and spiritualism and all these people using things like spirit photography and all this kind of stuff to prove that there is something more than um, what we can perceive of in the physical world. But you also have just as many people on the other side of things trying to prove that none of that is real. And uh, this collection of short stories is one of those, those things where they're sort of using the tropes of the ghost story genre, especially what was going on at the time in this genre, to uh, sort of poke fun at it a little bit and just point out that, hey, a lot of these things do have perfectly natural explanations, even if they are kind of unpleasant. Like, comment below, which would be worse? Would you rather be felt up by the drunk brother or a ghost? Personally, I think I would rather the ghost than the drunk guy. Speaking as a woman? Oh. Well, yeah, I don't know. I think for me, I'd, I'd rather have the ghost than the drunk guy. You might feel different, but comment below uh, with your thoughts on um, this episode's ghost story. So if you have enjoyed, please like, subscribe, comment below, share the video around so that other people can also find these uh, great authors. And as always, if you have a request for a story that you would like me to read, please leave it in the comment sections below and, well, comment section, there's only one. <laughs> Just uh, leave it in the comment section below. And as long as it is public domain, I will be more than happy to uh, read that for you and provide my own, I won't call them good comments. I don't know if I would call my little interruptions to the stories good, but, it's like a stream of consciousness thing, and I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy it. So until later, everybody, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well, and please join me here again soon for another video.